Welcome back again everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and we are now going to look at Revelation chapter 18 which deals with the fall of the woman, the mother of harlot spoken of in Revelation chapter 17. As we move into Revelation 18 we have to realize that we are now attempting to interpret the meaning of this part of the prophecy almost entirely in terms of future events. In fact it is entirely future. So obviously uh, this is not the usual historicist approach that we have been using throughout this series. We can't use this exact approach now. We can use the principles but we can't refer to history at this moment because the events prophesied of here have not yet occurred. It is important therefore to exercise caution and to try and avoid wild speculation. The fact of the matter is I simply don't know how it's all going to play out. I don't know the exact order of things and I think that anyone looking at the state of the world would understand that world affairs are very complicated and that there is a lot of intrigue, secrecy and wickedness going on in high places and for a person to try and unravel this is basically impossible. However, this presents no problem to God, so we must and we will trust in our Saviour to work out his eternal purposes, even in the middle of the abounding wickedness of our own Western nations. One of the main aims of this entire series, insofar as has been intended by myself, has been to demonstrate the validity and great truth of the historicist understanding of Bible prophecy and in so doing to lay bare the false schools of apocalyptic interpretation, those being the schools of the futurists, preterists and idealists, and I believe that this has been done. Accordingly, when we come to these later chapters, chapters 18 through to chapter 22, it is important for us to realize that while there may be a significant divergence in views among historicists as to what may actually transpire on the ground in our world today, we should not let that detract from the historicist understanding of Bible prophecy as a whole. The historicist understanding is biblical and true, and it is in the same vein as what Peter said in 2 Peter 1 verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So don't cast aside anything of what we have learned just because we have a disagreement with somebody about what's next on the prophetic calendar. So with that said, let's get on with the contents of this chapter. Actually, before I get into this chapter, another thought has crossed my mind, and that is to do in relation to the more complex nature of the prophecy that has been developing since the latter part of Revelation 16. Now if we stand back and look at the big picture, we see in the grand prophecy given Daniel 2 and 7, four great world empires, those being the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian and Roman empires. And although the whole image of these four great world empires is cloaked in Babylonianism, and this is so because the head is Babylon, the main target of the prophecy is the fourth world empire. This is what the grand prophecy spends most of its time on and it is this part that covers the longest stretch of time by far. The time from pagan Rome through its time of transition to papal Rome as the feet of vine mixed with clay and constituted of ten toes or ten European kingdoms as we know it and this is continuing in this world to this very day. In Daniel 2 we see that the fifth kingdom, the stone kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, smites the feet of the image and the whole system of the kingdoms of men is completely destroyed and blown away forever. That's the big picture view and it is quite straightforward. 
However, what is not so straightforward is the actual working out of all of this in history, particularly as it pertains to the Fourth World Empire. Now, this Fourth World Empire has gone through its pagan and papal periods of dominating the world. However, just as the papacy lost all of its temporal power in the 1800s, and it looked set to collapse completely, it hasn't. A change has occurred. There appears to be a last and final transition in this fourth world empire. And we talked previously, if you recall, about the fall of the European crowns and the emergence of a European Republic. And of course, right now, this European Republic or European Union is right at the forefront of a tremendous clash with Russia at this particular point in time. It looks very serious and it looks like it's going to escalate and go all the way, time will tell. However, putting that aside for a moment, in addition to all of this, other worldly powers and influences have also been brought into play by God to work out his will and purposes in this earth. For example, in Revelation 16 verses 12 and 14, we now have the kings of the east on the world stage. In Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14, three unclean spirits, which are the spirits of devils, have come into play. They are deceiving the nations. They are gathering them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty in Revelation 16 verse 14. And that is not a single uh, final battle in any particular year or day. This has been a process of war and calamity that has been part of the 20th century and is continuing strong to this very day and doubtless will reach its climax soon. We also have, uh, all of that was under the sixth vial, then the seventh vial of wrath poured, was poured out into the air in Revelation 16 verse 17. Uh, also in Revelation 16 verse 19, we saw the great city was divided into three parts. And in Revelation 16 verse 21, that failed to produce any repentance. People, the nations, the kings of the earth, uh, the beast did not change its ways. And then we moved into Revelation chapter 17 and we saw that the woman is dressed, talking and behaving like she has been unaffected by the first five vials of wrath. Then we saw in that same chapter the ten kingdoms of the beast hating the woman and turning on her. And now we're in Revelation 18, we, we will be looking at the woman being destroyed and connected with this, we will see the kings of the earth and the rich men lamenting because of her destruction. And then over in Revelation 19, we have the destruction of the beast, among other things. We are right in the middle of all of this transpiring around us now. This makes the prophecy more difficult to understand because we do not have the benefit of any historical record and this is because we are no longer spectators in the grand oh, I'll say that again we are no longer spectators of the grand prophecy we are part of the grand prophecy and we are living in a time that will be the history for others to look at later that is if there is sufficient time left in God's calendar who knows but it's very exciting to be part of the prophecy right at the moment. The timeline we have reached going from vial six to seven is where you and I are today. Right now, we must not abandon the approach to understanding the prophecy as we have seen throughout this series, the historicist approach to Bible prophecy. We must be careful not to become vain speculators now as the futures are, but at the same time, it is reasonable for each one of us to study the prophecy and work out as best as we can the meaning of these things and share that study around so that somewhere in all of this, 
we may we might well come to a true understanding as to the exact meaning of all of this as it applies to the point we are now at. Charles Jennings says in his book, The Book of Revelation from an Israelite and Historicist Interpretation, the following, Even though it appears that the Roman Catholic Church now plays a minor part in the world's economic affairs, she is still considered the mother of harlots and abominations of the false religious system that is in existence today. The complicated nature of this diabolical system is multi-religious in that it now embraces Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, Mohammedism and diverse forms of paganism. This complicated nature of Babylon is also entangled with the political economic systems of the earth. Who is able to understand its many surreptitious operations in international, national and even the personal affairs of every living soul on the planet. And this is basically where I am at. It's very difficult to understand the precise nature of everything that is within this fourth world empire. We have ecclesiastical Babylon, we can see this, but what is not so clear is that she has her Jesuit agents throughout the nations of the earth. They are in the high offices of the land or they are affecting the high offices of the land. Uh, that is much harder to see and work out fully. The woman, Ecclesiastical Babylon, is directly connected to the European Union and the banking and financial and trade systems of the world. Yet in Revelation 18, we see the woman being destroyed first. And as a result, the kings of the earth and the merchant men, the globalists, while not destroyed at that point, are nonetheless in disarray and are going to distance themselves from the woman, as we're going to go on and see later. The woman is shown to be separate from these, yet at the same time, these rulers of the earth, these globalists, are part of this same fourth world empire and will also be destroyed and removed forever. But what is the exact line of delineation between all of these? I don't know. And that is the point that I am trying to make here. I don't have all of the answers, but I have plenty of questions, which I hope will be answered in the fullness of time. That ecclesiastical Babylon is still riding the beast, I think is quite clear. Apart from the European Union, which is her child, she also plays her part on the global stage. In this article of the 15th of March 2021 from Breivart.com, we read the following. It's called, Pope Francis calls for new world order after the pandemic. Remember, this is not coming from the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's not coming from Klaus Schwab. It's coming from Pope Francis. It says, Rome. Pope Francis insists in a new book things will never be the same in a post-pandemic world, calling instead for, for the establishment of a new world order. In a book-length interview with journalist Domenico Agasso titled God and the World to Come, scheduled for release in Italian on Tuesday, the pontiff reiterates his case for the Great Reset with a shift away from financial speculation, you will own nothing and be happy, fossil fuels and military build up toward a green economy based on inclusiveness. In this article from Forbes.com, having the date of the 9th of December 2020, uh, we read about a shadow council being created by the Pope of Rome. The article is called Pope Francis Partners with Corporate Titans to Make Capitalism More Inclusive and Fair. Is this for real or just corporate virtue signaling? Part of the article says this. In response to the Pope's exhortation, business and public sector leaders formed an historic partnership with the Vatican. The Council for Inclusive Capitalism will serve as a movement to address the economic and environmental needs of the planet and its inhabitants. The Council boasts over more than 10.5 trillion in assets under management, 
companies with over 2.1 trillion of market capitalization and 200 million workers in over 163 countries. So I think that we can see that we definitely have a, a kind of separation. We have separate evil systems working in this earth. We have, on the one hand, the Pope uh, calling for a new world order and a great uh, reset. And uh, they are merely echoing in the other side uh, the position set forth by the World Economic Forum and everyone uh, involved with this. Uh, we can see there is a strong and direct connection between the papacy and the corporate world. There is a, an interdependency that is operating among them. They cannot function the way they do without the other party. Now, as we're going to see later, when the woman is destroyed, the kings of the earth and the globalists, they distance themselves from her. Nonetheless, they are left in disarray and dismay because of her destruction. However, for now, let's get on with the, the contents of Revelation 18. We'll go to uh, verse 1, which I believe is going to be quite exciting. Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. If you recall, right back in the very first part of this entire Revelation series, we saw that while this book is a book of prophecy, it is also the revelation of Jesus Christ, and its principal purpose, the purpose that undergirds the book is to reveal Jesus Christ to us. He is risen from the dead, he is glorified, and he is on the throne, and he is in control. This is his story, and once more at this late stage in the prophecy, our attention is again fixed upon him. Wonderful. So first off the bat, and as a matter of utmost importance, let us ask the question, who is this angel here? What angel has great power and is able to lighten the earth with his glory? Revelation 1 verse 16, speaking of Jesus says, Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Ezekiel 43, verse 1, verse 1, Afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Wonderful. In my opinion, Revelation 18 verse 1 is strikingly familiar with Revelation 10 verse 1, the period that gave us the opening of the European Reformation. Revelation 10 verse 1 tells us of the, might, the mighty angel that came down from heaven and the description of this angel given there was a description of the Lord Jesus Christ and he had a little book open in his hand and this was the beginning of the breaking forth of the mighty work of the Protestant Reformation which was undergirded by a little book open and that book was the open Bible. At that point in history, Europe was in the iron fist grip of the papacy, and because of this, the people were in terrible spiritual bondage and darkness. By all accounts, there was no remedy and no way through. The situation was utterly hopeless, if you were considering this from a spiritual revival point of view. The people were in total darkness. But then Jesus Christ himself caused the open Bible to come forth to the masses and it changed the course of Europe and with it the rest of the world. And I'm not going to repeat all of those details here because they are covered off in these earlier parts which you can refer to. Now we do obviously have an open Bible today and we can thank the Lord for that. However, the situation is not entirely dissimilar to that of the time of the Reformation. 
The masses of people, including the mass of church-going people, are in gross spiritual ignorance and darkness. The world has invaded the church. It has invaded it with worldly dress, and that generally means a lack of it for the most part, worldly music, worldly philosophy, worldly principles, and so on. The world has turned the church upside down instead of it being the other way round. We are in the Laodicean age, a church that is not hot nor cold but lukewarm and it makes God sick as it says in Revelation 3 verse 16. An event like the Reformation of the 16th century doesn't seem likely given the state of affairs today. But then we read Revelation 18 verse 1, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Marvellous! This chapter deals with the destruction of the woman and its worldwide consequences and effects, but the very same chapter opens with what appears to be good news. This angel coming down has great power and lightens the earth with his glory. Could not this be the light of illumination of God's word through God's spirit once again poured out into the hearts and minds of a great multitude of people? Could not this be a reformation far greater than the European reformation? Could it not be a reformation far more effective than the European reformation which, despite the many blessings it produced, had many shortcomings? If this understanding is correct, then this will either precede or accompany the great destruction of the woman that is detailed in this chapter. The people that God has, or will yet call unto himself, are going to be preserved. They're not going to be raptured out of here. They're going to be preserved amidst all this turmoil and trouble coming upon the earth. Such a reformation would once again have to be in the western countries of this earth, which are the seat of Christianity in the world, because they house the literal lineal descendants of the whole house of Israel, those people which originally made up these nations, and God has not forsaken his people Israel, as it says in Romans 11 verse 1. This is the end of Revelation 18, part 1.